It's got titled Dissecting Defensive Structures, and it's the, the third in the series that we've run so far, and specifically about highlighting different areas of the game. So rather than trying to cover everything, trying to be a little bit more specific. Today, um, as we put defensive structures under the microscope, we're going to try to do more than simply glance over them, and hopefully we can provide some greater detail into a variety of different defensive structures. So the webinar will run for about one and a half hours, and it's going to cater for all levels, including for a higher performance perspective. Uh, future webinars, we're still going to try to look at doing some on tactics, effective goal scoring, attacking structures, and a few other areas. Before we start, I've muted everyone's audio. So if you want to ask a question at any time, please just unmute yourself and ask. And if, for example, you don't want to do it by asking that way, the chat's there as well that you can just type something into. So first thing is, my name's Steve Willer, and I'm the current Australian men's indoor hockey coach. And I've been in this role since 2016. Um, and I've been coaching indoor for a fair while now, over 20 years. So hopefully I can offer you a bit of my insights tonight. Now, I'm going to break the webinar tonight into a few different areas. So it's going to be broken into man-to-man, -man, zonal, pressing, extra player sort of situations, less common sort of defensive structures, and we'll finish off with some questions that you might have that haven't popped up during the actual webinar or you wanna to wait to the end, up to you. The information's from my point of view and the various teams and coaches will have different interpretations and changes to each structure. Each structure needs to be modified to work for your team and your players for it to be effective against any particular opposition. Um, Often the defensive structures are named because of their look when I refer to them. And some of the names that I give them and we talk about tonight might be known to you as, you know, a different name or a different structure. Before we start though, I wanna just clarify some terminology that I use. The, the concepts of a defensive structure and a press in my view are different. So a defensive structure is a setup used to defend, to resist an attack to stop an effective attack. It is reactive to the attacking team. Whereas pressing, it's proactive. And a press is a setup that actively applies pressure throughout movement to the attacking team to force them to move the ball and force a turnover and force them to do something that you want. So I have a slightly different view just in terms of defensive structure and pressing that they're two slightly different things. The first thing I'd like to start with is the most common and the easiest to understand of the defensive structures in my view, and that's the deep man-to-man -man structure. Here's a, a quick example of the deep man-to-man -man, just from a, a 2020 Euro hockey match. Orange is the Netherlands and white is Austria. Okay, so let's have a little bit of a closer look at it in a bit more detail. So the first thing is that each player is responsible and accountable for an opposition player. They must follow that player and stick with that player. There's no handing over or swapping of players. They, they follow that player basically wherever they go. The next thing is that the two front forwards are positioned on the halfway line, hence why it's called the deep man-to-man. And the two forwards try to hold the middle of the court and prevent any passes or any players running the ball through the middle of the court. So they try to secure that middle. The back three players are assigned to an opposition player and they follow their player around and try to prevent them getting the ball. If they do get the ball, then they try to prevent them from eliminating them. So they try to hold them up or, or dispossess them depending on the, the situation. A key with the deep man-to-man -man defensive structure is that the players do not follow their opponent across the halfway line. So if one of those players makes some sort of movement and they run across the halfway line, then they don't physically follow them in this structure. 
as the two front players try to protect the middle of the court, they encourage the opposition to play the ball wide and down the boards. So they're protecting that middle and they really want to try to force the defending, sorry, the attacking team, the opposition, to pass that ball down the side of the court. When the opposition plays the ball forward and then down the boards, the closest front player, that forward, who is beaten by the pass, then sprints back and helps. So what that then does is that brings that player who's been eliminated essentially by that pass back and the forward that sprints back aims to create a one versus two situation. So one attacker and two defenders. And the objective is to outnumber the ball carrier when they're on the boards, trying to force that turnover there. So here's another a video clip showing that deep man-to-man -man defensive structure. So just have a think about a few of those little things we just talked about then and see if you can pick up on a few of them. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to have a little bit of a, a look at it in a little bit of detail now. So I'm going to bring up just a, another app that I've got just so that we can look at the actual... Um, let's get rid of that for the moment. All right, I'm going to bring up just a slightly different app and then we can have a look at how that all works. I'll try again. Sorry, there was a little bit of a error in it. Okay, so that should have popped up now. All right. So Here's the, the same video that we just watched, but let's have a bit of a look at it as it actually goes. So the first thing that we notice is we have these two forwards here in the center of the court that are trying to hold the middle of the court. And they've got that sort of accountability or responsibility for these two players up the front here and trying to protect that middle. If we then look down the back of the court, we've got a group of two players here. So we've got an Austrian player in the white, and a Netherlands player in the orange, another two there, and another two there, which is our three players at the back who are marking man to man. As we watch the clip, we can see that as these three players run around the court in terms of the Netherlands players move around, that the Austrian player follows them. Now, just here, this is where we have this one versus two situation happening. So the ball beats this first line forward here and gets in behind. And we then have these two players here come over to the ball. What then happens is the player who's been eliminated by that pass comes back to join their teammate here in defense and then create that one versus two situation. So we now have this situation here of outnumbering the ball carrier. The ball here is then being played back out and then everyone goes back to their responsibilities again in terms of the defensive setup. And again, we can see just as the ball beats the forward here and goes down into here, we can see this forward trying to come back again to create that one versus two situation. Okay, so we're going to have a, a look at another clip. And again, we'll, we'll look at it in a bit of detail here. So I'll play the clip firstly. And again, it's a deep man-to-man -man structure.
So the main thing I wanted to, to bring up in this clip and show you is we've still got the same thing where we've still got our two forwards here trying to protect the middle. We've still got our three players at the back here still chasing their men around the court. However, this clip shows the concept we're talking about, about not following the player over the halfway line. So over on this side of the court, what's going to happen is the Netherlands player is going to make a lead back into this end of the court. And we're going to see that this Austrian player doesn't follow them over the halfway line. But instead, what they do is they stay in their half of the court and they track with them and then pick them up when they cross the halfway line again. So if we just watch these two players here, crosses the halfway line, it's going to track with him and track with this player and then pick them back up over in this area of the court. So they don't cross the halfway line and that's one of the important things about this concept. The second thing that's really good in this clip is we've got a forward here. That's one of the two middle forwards protecting the middle area. And what they're doing is they're responsible for this player here. This player does a pass and then what they do is they run across the halfway line. And then this player here on the right runs up and sort of takes their spot. So what we end up seeing is that the players have an interchange of responsibility. So this player ends up becoming one of the forwards and follows this player over the halfway line because this player drops with the Netherlands player and then becomes a man-to-man -man player much tighter. So we'll play it slowly here. And if you just watch this middle section here, you'll see how now they pick that player up and you'll see how the new player is just slotted in now to that position. Okay, so let's just go back into where we were. All right, so we're now back to this section. We'll just move to the next section. So now we're gonna have a bit of a chat about the actual man-to-man -man defensive structure. And it's basically the same as the deep man-to-man. -man. But the main difference is that the front players start closer to the ball and they start inside the attacking half of the court. And secondly, that the defending players will follow their player into the attacking half of the court and they'll cross that halfway line rather than sort of stopping at that halfway line area. So here's an example, it's a very short one, but it will basically show that the players then move forwards across that um, halfway line. Actually, sorry, that's... Uh, Just having a look at some reason that's the uh, the wrong clip that I wanted to show you. Yeah, so that's not. Oh, sorry, I've I've mixed myself up. I've got a little bit confused here. Sorry, this is just a, a quick clip just showing the, the higher man-to-man -man structure. So you can see that the players are a bit higher up the court. And as we said that with this man-to-man -man structure that the two forwards are playing a little bit higher. So it's not very different except for the height of the actual defensive structure. So these two forwards move and start further up the court. And then the next difference is, as we mentioned, that if a player runs back into their defensive half, then the defender will follow them into that area of the court rather than waiting on the halfway line. And this is the clip I was thinking that I was showing next, which shows one of those situations where they'll cross the halfway line and they'll be followed.
So you can see in that clip there that when the player that number 19 in the black, the German number 19, is marking when he crosses the halfway line, he also follows him over. So he doesn't just stand there and stop, but he continues to go all the way across. Now, a couple of thoughts on the man-to-man -man in terms of its, its structure. The first thing is it's a very simple structure for players to understand. Essentially, they're assigned to a player. They follow that player around. It creates direct pressure on the opposition to do a number of things. The first thing is it creates a lot of pressure for them to receive under pressure with a player right there trying not to receive where the ball comes off their stick, trying not to receive where they expose the ball, but having to receive under pressure. It puts pressure on them to get to the ball first. So the ball's being thrown and they've got a player right on them, so trying to get to it first. It's pressure on them to lead around and move to create space. Because there's a player on them, they have to move to try to create something and make that happen. And often they're receiving a pass on the move. So more likely than not, when the ball is passed, they're going to have to receive it on the move. The, st the defensive structure in terms of man-to-man -man also puts the defender into a one versus one situation a lot of times. So what that means is if they get eliminated or they get eliminated quickly, then that ball carrier is free without anyone putting them under pressure. And it means someone has to leave their player to then apply that pressure, leaving players open, leaving spaces and gaps. There's a lack of cover defence. It's reactive to the opposition and the opposition has control. So wherever the players run, the defenders chase and they follow. It can open up space for the opposition in key areas because they might leave the middle of the court open because they've let out of that section. So it can expose certain areas that we may not want to. And it can create chaos and movement and opportunities and gaps because there's a lot of moving around and a lot of chasing and therefore that creates opportunities for structure to fall away and gaps to be provided. Now we're gonna have a bit of a look at some actual um, clips for the man-to-man -man again, and just look at a, a few different little things. So the first one is this clip shows us about times when deep marking man player needs to have good situational awareness. So they need to know when to stop marking the opposition player and when to cover a particular line. So in this clip, see if you can notice where that moment is when a player makes that decision to leave their player and instead cover a particular line. All right, we'll go back to the iPad again and just have a look at it where we can draw over it a little bit. So here's the, the same clip. So the ball's in play, the white team has it, which is Poland, and the black team is Germany. Now, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at how this player here, number 29 for the German team, makes a decision about when to remove himself from marking man to man and when the option becomes better to then cover a particular line. So as we play, we'll play it a little bit slower here. We can see in this situation here that the two German players essentially have this middle section all covered. So the likelihood of this Polish player being able to get the ball through here is extremely unlikely. If the ball was to go over here to this player, then it's extremely likely they could get the ball by coming down this side, but they're not gonna get it through this middle space here. So as we play, we notice the Polish player lead into this area here, and we notice that the German player decides to hold there for a moment. As they do that, and then we notice that the player starts to move over here and we can start to see this pass, the German player is then in the perfect position then to pick this little interception up and make sure that the Polish team isn't able to get anywhere with it. Now that's occurred because this player had the awareness 
to realise this player couldn't get the ball through those spaces, but the space the ball could come was here. And if something else happened, he was still close enough that he could have gone back and picked this player up. So players having the awareness to be able to know when to leave that player is really important for them. And we need to make sure that they do understand that there is times when they should leave that player to create those spaces. So this example is to show you that often there's no real cover defence. And when a defending player needs to be sure that they're not quickly eliminated. So if we look at this clip, we've got the, the green team, which is Australia, the white team, which is Poland. And what we're going to notice is the situation where the defender makes an error there. And then that results in this situation where a quick goal is able to be scored because there's no one to help cover and there's no time to then encounter that player. So just here, the pass comes down and there's a bit of a mistrap by the Polish player in the sideboards. That results then in a very quick play here where it's one on the keeper or it could be a two-on-one with the other Polish defender there and then results in a goal. So one of the things with man-to-man -man is we need to ensure that these little errors aren't going to be in areas which could cost us quick goals against. Right, here's a, another example of how in a man-to-man -man structure there's often no cover defence. And when the defending player is eliminated, another defender often needs to leave their player to pressure the ball carrier. All right, so let's have a look at that one again, and we'll look at it again in a little bit more detail. So right here at this point, what we have is the German player is able to quickly eliminate his opponent. The Polish player here hasn't been able to hold him up long enough. And that means that this player here from Poland hasn't been able to come back and create that one versus two. And we then have the situation down here where the Polish player is caught and either decides to go out and apply pressure out into this area or decides to hold. And in this case, he decides to apply that pressure. So here we are where we've got to the situation where they're quickly eliminated and this player hasn't had a chance to get back. Comes around and then down in this area of the court, what we notice is that the players had to leave his player now and then that's created this open opportunity for this player and only some luck there and a good save has really made it so that they didn't score in that situation there. We'll have a look at uh, another one now. We'll look at one where we look at that distance between the front line and the back line. So here's the video clip to start with. So the white team is defending, which is Austria. Now, what we want to look at here is we want to look at this part here. So when this player here picks the ball up, we've got this defender. And now that this player here has been eliminated by that pass, we really need that player to come back and then help to create that one versus two situation. And sometimes if this gap gets a little bit too big between our players or this player doesn't recognise that they need to come back early enough, then it becomes a one-on-one -on -one situation down here. So we can see here that the player's got the ball down here and we really need this player to be coming back to assist to make that one-on-two situation. And again, just an excellent sort of piece of defensive work there has then allowed them to get out of that situation. It's really important that that forward gets back and helps to create that one-on-two. All right, let's have a look at another one. Whoops, wrong one. 
There we go. So dark team Germany is defending, white team's attacking. So what we notice here is the situation where a player loses a little bit of awareness. So we've got, go back a fraction, we've got these two here and the player from the white team leads in and then we've got the white team here who's leading out. So that means this German defender follows their player over. This German defender doesn't quite realise what's happening and they come out here. Whether they've come out here because they've decided they want to try to intercept the pass or whether they've come out because they haven't realised, for example, that there's another German defender coming into that space. But what happens is the Polish player here gets into the middle and then they end up finding themselves free. So unfortunately, because there was no awareness there in terms of what was happening with these two players here, that's then allowed this player to get free, which then allows this easy ball across. And as we can see all this room here, And again, a situation which could have quite easily turned into a goal against. So again, with that one-on-one -on -one situation in terms of hand to man, it's really important that players communicate and they're aware of what's happening. All right, let's have a look at a, another one. We're going to look at transitioning. So often sometimes where a free hit happens, we can't necessarily start in the setup that we want. And that can happen with man-to-man -man sort of defense. So here we've got a clip where the free hit, or the free push, I should say, is located just over on this side of the court over here. And because of that, we end up having players slightly set up differently. And we've got this player back here that's all the way free. In general, when the team has this free down here near our circle, we tend to have two players near it. So we sort of have two players near the free. And in the moment that the free happens, one player stays with the player. And then the other player generally follows that pass because it generally goes to the player who hasn't got a man assigned to them. So as we watch it here, you'll notice that this player is going to stay with this man. And then this player will end up going up to become that player's accountable defender. And we're back into that man on man structure there. We've got our two, our two, our two, and these two assigned to each of them. And you can see we're sort of back into that structure for that man to man. So watch it one more time there. Two players near the ball, one then keeps with the ball carrier who passed it, and the other one moves on to the player that was free. All right, last one when we talk about the man-to-man, -man, and it's just another example of that transferring and being able to change into the man-on-man -man structure. So here again with this clip, we'll notice that the free is here inside the half of the court. We've got two defenders here on that free. While we've got back here man-on-man, man-on-man, this player worrying about this player, and this player is basically free at the moment. There's a slight difference in this one, though, because... This player will still pick up the player who passes, but this player here won't follow the pass. And you'll see why in a second. So he doesn't follow the pass there because the pass goes to this player, which this player is already accountable for. So then he just becomes accountable for this player. So it's again that awareness and that recognition of who is the player I'm gonna end up picking up after this all happens. Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint show.
And we're going to move on to the area of some of the zonal structures now. So in terms of the first zonal structure, we're going to look at what I call a trapezium or a three, two. And it's a common zonal structure that's, that's used and there's slight little variations to it that happen as well. But um, a lot of the, the principles around the zonal structures are very similar. So here's a, a quick little video example. And as you can see, we're not following man to man there, we're holding spaces, we're holding areas. So if we take a little bit more of a detailed look now into this sort of defensive structure, we'll notice that there's two forwards that are on the halfway line and that they're trying to close that middle. So they don't want passes through that middle, they don't want people to run through that middle. The two defenders on either side on the boards and the middle defender is in the center there. Now, depending on where the opponents are, oops, depending on where the opponents are, the defenders are stepping forwards or backwards a bit, and they're trying to move a little bit left or right, and they're trying to apply that little bit of pressure on a player that falls into their zone. So rather than chasing players around or staying with the same player, if a player sort of enters our zone or our area and we believe that a pass might be able to go to them, we step up and we apply that little bit of pressure to them. So it's just that little bit of movement but not chasing players around. So here's a, a little bit more of an example of it. So the blue team is the Czech Republic and they're defending. Okay, so let's, Similar to before, let's have a little bit of a, a look on the iPad for that one in a bit more detail and just see if we can notice a few little things. So the first thing that we, we can sort of notice is roughly we've sort of got these two players and these three players at the back. This middle player might change a little bit of depth um, but essentially it's three players at the back and two at the front. Now, as the ball moves, we can see there's a player here and we can see a player here. And this player should be stepping up and applying a bit of pressure when they think this player might be looking at getting it. And this player should be looking at stepping up a bit. In this example, after a pass or two, this player here gets a bit worried because there's a player behind them. And then they try to encourage this player to sort of step up to that player on the outside. And that's where a little bit of confusion happens. But essentially, the three players should be looking at those three in front. All right, so we'll have a, a look at a, another clip. Now we looked at this one as just a video earlier, but we'll go back to it and have a bit of a look at it. We looked at it at the very start. Uh, let's find it, there it is. So this is the one we looked at at the start. Again, we've got those sort of two players at the front and the three at the back. And we notice how there's little movements. Now, as the ball goes over, notice that we then have these two players here and they try to protect this space through the middle. And this is one of the key things with this, is with our two lines that we have, that the outside players try to close that middle gap up and a player can't go through. 
if the ball is up the top area here, these two players try to close that middle gap up again, trying to discourage that ball through. So here we'll notice that the two players come across and they try to cover and discourage anything through there. And then this back player then covers the line through the middle there. All right, let's go back. All right, so some, some thoughts on zonal defending. We haven't finished zonal defending first, but before we move into some of the other structures, just a few little thoughts so that we can compare them to the man-on-man -man sort of structures. The first thing is the opposition often receive a pass while stationary. So earlier we spoke about the man-to-man, -man, that more often than not, the player is receiving on the move. With a zonal structure, more often than not, we find the opposition receiving the ball while standing still. The second thing is we find the defensive structure isn't altered by opposition player leads. So they run around, they move, but the defensive structure doesn't alter too much because they're not chasing them around. So it tends to hold that shape that it needs. The next thing is it creates situations where the defenders outnumber the ball carrier. So a one versus two. So one ball carrier, one attacker and two defenders. So we often have that ability then to outnumber them. The next thing is it provides cover defense. So we have that ability to have someone sitting behind, covering a gap, covering a line, being there in case something happens or there's elimination. It controls the space and the area on the court the opposition can use. So you can set up your zonal structure to force the opposition to only use a particular area or to try to keep them out of a certain area of the court. The next thing is, it's more disciplined structure though for the players to understand because they have to hold and work with each other and it's not as easy as just following a player around. So it requires a little bit more discipline to maintain that structure. It's often, there's no direct pressure on an opposition player in receiving. So players can often receive the ball and not have as much pressure on them. So they're not gonna make as many simple little receiving errors or feel that pressure when the ball's coming to them. They don't often have to fight to get the ball. It can create a situation where the defense waits for the opposition to attack for them to go forwards. So it can almost be like this stalemate situation where the defenders are sitting back there, moving left and right, while the attackers are just holding the ball and passing it between themselves at the back and nothing sort of really happens and nothing's really happening because the attacking team's waiting for the defenders to do something. After a number of passes, the defense can lose its structure and positioning. So on that last one, one of the things you would have noticed already in just a few of the little clips we've shown is that the longer a team maintains their defensive structure, so the more passes an opposition makes, the more a defensive structure can lose its shape and it can lose its effectiveness. So it really takes that discipline for that shape to be maintained. I'm going to talk about a slight variation on the, um, that trapezium 3-2. And I call it the olive or the circle. And again, it's because of its shape. So if we look at this clip here, you're going to notice in this clip that the shape looks a little bit more like a circle. It's not really two and three. It's sort of like almost two, one, two, maybe two, two, one, but it sort of becomes that sort of circle shape. So let's see if we can have a bit of a look at that one on the iPad again. So here it is on this little app I've got. So what you can see is just this little type of shape that I'm talking about. It's, it's a little bit more of that, that olive, that squash sort of circle. And that's why I sort of the sort of olive or the circle. So it's not as clear cut as having say two up front and three at the back. Um, so I sort of call it like that. And again, if you notice, it's got similar sort of characteristics to the other one, 
it's when a player is close, they might put some pressure on them. So we've got a player here and we've got a player here. So they may come and put a little bit of pressure on them if they think they're going to get the ball. We've got a player out here and a player here. So they may apply some pressure if they think they're going to get the ball. Player here and a player here. So they may apply pressure if they think they're going to get the ball. So again, if they come into those zones or those areas, they're going to try to protect it. These gaps here, these two players will try to encourage that the ball can't go through. These two players will try to encourage the ball can't go through. And if you notice on the side at the moment, here's our ball carrier. And if we draw a circle from them to the goal and it goes between these two players, it's this player here who sort of sits in that position where they can sort of cover this sort of area of the ball is to get through them. So as we play it, you'll notice that the little shifting. So you notice that this player over here, how they shift as the ball goes across to get that little bit closer to that player. You'll notice that down in this area of the court, that they shift to get a little bit closer as well as the ball moves across. So there's these little tiny shifts and these little bit of movements as the ball goes back and forth. There's not a lot of movement happening. And again, it's about holding those spaces and those areas. This player has decided to step up a little bit, which is now going to apply that little bit of pressure. And that's now forced this player to do something and make this pass. So as we spoke about before, if we just sit in these sort of zonal structures at times, what can happen is just lots of passes happen and nothing else. And it's almost like a stalemate. And it's waiting for the defenders to do something. Here, the defenders pushed up. And we can notice that then this player has decided to step in front because they go, very likely this player will get the ball and they've decided to step up to make that little intercept. And this player follows this player across. So one of the things about that zonal structure too is we tend to find, whereas with man-to-man, -man, it's almost a fight for the ball. With the zonal, it's almost as if a player jumps in front trying to um, intercept the pass without that sort of fight for it. So it's a, like a really quick sort of intercept. All right, let's have a look at another example. So let's, let's see where it is, here it is. So the orange team is Netherlands and the blue team is the Czech team. The blue team's defending here again. So again, if we sort of just pause there and have a quick look, we sort of again get that sort of circular type structure. So we've got two here, one a little bit higher, one a little bit higher, and then one a little bit higher again. So we sort of get that, that sort of skewy shape. So as you can see in this one, there's a lot more movement by the blue team, the Czech team trying to move. So as the ball comes out wide, we've got this player out here applying that little bit of pressure. And then this player moves in again to cover this sort of space through here to prevent them coming back through the middle. So it's not about them cutting off the pass back. It's about them preventing the ball coming back into that middle area. Again, a little bit of pressure applied here. This player has put himself in a position where if the ball was to come down this side of the court, he can move to it and cover it. Now, when we get to this section here, we've got these two players and this player is again lined up in the middle between those players. So again, we have this, this situation where we can have these covering players all the time. This time, notice this player has come wider of this player and sat out here earlier. And that's because he had the awareness to know that player was out there. So rather than sitting in here this time, he's come out wider. But notice that when he's gone out wider, so if we use that as our player line, and he's gone wider, notice the gap through there is still covered, but it's now covered by the other player at the back. So we don't expose these passing lines through the middle there. All right, we'll have a look at another one. Uh, there it is. So the white team is defending here.
So a few little things that I want to sort of bring up in this one. So the first thing is, again, we can sort of see this sort of circular type structure here. We've got player a bit deeper, a bit deeper. And then at the back, so again, we've got these players all on these different lines making more of this circular shape. This player here continually applies pressure to this player. And they do it with this player. They're doing it before this player here can pass them the ball. So what it then does is discourages this player here from making the pass, and then this player doesn't get the ball. So he moves up really early before the player can get it, and then that stops that pass happening. So here we notice he started that little bit of a step to begin with. And now as soon as this guy's receiving, he's getting that little bit closer. And now the player on the ball is looking up and he's going, this is not a good pass to make. So he doesn't make it. Again, he's stepped up, sort of saying this pass here, you're not going to be able to do it. So he doesn't give it. But what happens now is this player's now got the ball before this player could step up and stop him getting the ball. So now what he decides to do is if his player's already got the ball, he now maintains a defensive position rather than pushing up on him and getting eliminated. So if our player can get to the player before the pass to discourage it, he'll do it. But if the player gets the ball before we can sort of discourage it, then he just holds. So you'll notice there how he's just holding now rather than going. And now notice again, these two players are coming together to sort of cover that middle portion. And this player here is starting to move in a little bit to try to cover that ball through. And this player here is looking at covering that ball down the outside. All right, let's uh, go back to our show again. All right, so we're now going to look at the next sort of zonal type structure. And this one's called a dice or an X system. The dice, because it sort of looks a little bit like a five, you roll it, or an X because purely that it has that shape. So the green team here, the Australian team, is going to set up the X, the, the dice, against the red team, which is Czech Republic. So you can sort of see that X shape there. All right, so let's have a little bit of a look at it in a bit more detail. So the first thing is we've got our five green players, which is the X. And each role. So we've got a left forward who's there, who's directly in front of the ball. So we want them to apply some direct pressure on the ball carrier and be three metres away. Now, this is what I would call sort of a full sort of X where everyone's sort of pushed right up. You can also play one where it starts back on the halfway and it would be like a, a deep X. So this could be done as a full one or a deep one similar to the man-to-man. -man. So at the moment in the full one, you're up there three metres away applying pressure so that the ball carrier can't run the ball or the angles to pass around them are going to be quite sharp. We then have the forward on the other side of the court. They're trying to protect that there's no sort of real pass sort of going to come down that left forward's right sort of side and get out through the middle section there. So they're sort of protecting that and also they're a bit deeper to encourage the pass to the opposite defender. You've then got the middle forward who's trying to protect the hotline. So the hotline, for those that don't know that terminology, is it's essentially a line from the ball to the goal. And it's a direct line, and that player is protecting that line so that they can't pass the ball directly towards the goal and into the top of the circle. And their job is to then pressure whoever the person who gets the ball on the side of the court is. The next thing we then have is the defenders. So the deepest of the two defenders is on the ball side and they cover the gap between the left forward and the mid forward, so that very small gap. And then they're also in a position where if there was a player down that corner, they could confront them as well. 
The other defender, the right defender, so in this case it's because the ball's on the left side, covers the gap between the right um, forward and that midfield player in the centre there. So if the ball was to come between them, that right defender there would be looking at picking it up. So when the ball moves across, everyone sort of shifts across. And you'll notice now the ball's on the right, that the right defender is deeper and the left defender is that little bit higher. And again, the left forward's a little bit deeper than the right forward to encourage the pass back to the defender. Because one of the things about this structure, similar to the man's man, is it's trying to encourage the opposition to pass the ball wide and not through the middle. And then it's looking at trying to apply pressure in a one versus two situation, so to outnumber the opposition. So as the ball then was to go down, that forward that's eliminated comes back, the middle forward comes across, and that's the two players who are then helping in terms of trying to dispossess or apply the pressure to that player from the opposition who receives the ball. So create that one verse two. All right, here's another clip showing this X structure or dice. So again, the green team's defending. All right, so let's have a little bit of a look at that again. So the first thing, that we're going to notice is that once it's started here, notice that the player near the ball in terms of the green player is much closer and that the player in the center of the court number seven is sort of roughly on that hot line. So if the ball is to be passed through the middle, that he would be able to intercept that or dispossess that. As the ball's played across, the right sort of forward now applies the pressure. And again, the middle player is still on that hot line. As the ball goes down the sideboard, the middle player moves across and the forward who is eliminated comes in and applies pressure. The ball goes back and then they reset. As the ball goes out again, again, the forward who got eliminated comes in and helps with the middle player. He's passed the ball down towards the corner. So that defender now moves into a position and notice how he's holding more in court rather than worrying about the baseline. And that allows the goalkeeper to make a very easy save when a player is sort of shooting from this sort of angle. Now, in the middle of the court, in the top of the circle, we've got a red player, a check player coming down. As they come further down, it's the defender's job who's in the middle of the circle there to go deeper as well. So if they were to try to pass the ball along that back line and pass the goalkeeper or into a player for some sort of little tap-in, it's that player's job to cover that gap between the defender who's in the corner and the goalkeeper. And again, if you notice, nothing's sort of gone through the middle. Everything here has been kept really wide. And that's the big thing about this. This structure is about keeping everything wide and sort of covering that, that middle area. All right, we'll have a look at another one. So again, yellow team's defending here, red team's attacking, player close, two players near the boards. So again, you'll notice that they've tried to keep the opposition with the ball wide. And in particular here, notice that when we have this short pass here to the boards, we have the forward and the middle player again going over. But when the ball goes in the corner here, the defender goes, but the middle forward or that midfielder also comes to become that two defenders there on that one attacker. And again, you've got the defender in the middle of the circle covering the gap between the goalkeeper and the, the defender in the corner. So if the ball was to come across and then you've got a forward who's come back to near the spot area to cover a gap if it was to go between the two players confronting the ball carrier. 
and again, preventing them from children coming in court and forcing them to go back. All right, we're going to move on and have a look at situations, for example, where you're a player down. So it's very rare to play an entire indoor hockey match these days without at least having one player sent off. There always seems to be at least one green or yellow card during a match, and it's, it's extremely common. So every team needs to be able to make sure they can restructure or at least know how to defend when they go a player down, because the likelihood of it happening is extremely high. There are numerous defensive structure, structure options that can be implemented. In general, though, we don't tend to see man-on-man -man options in this case because the opposition tends to have one player up. So if we go man-to-man, -man, we're always leaving a man free. The first one we'll look at quickly is just default goal box. And essentially it's a box because it looks just like that sort of square sort of setup. And it's one of the more, more common ones that we do see when a, when a team goes down a player. With a lot of these setups, they tend to set up right near the top of the circle. And the reason for that is because they want to have as limited amount of space as possible that they need to protect. If they were sort of defending from the, the halfway line, they've got half the court with four players. Whereas having it down near the circle, they're essentially defending just the circle and the perimeter of that circle with four players. Now, this one's actually from the 2015 World Cup. So it um, was when we had sort of four field players, but I've used it as an example because the red team is put on an extra field player. So it gives them five players. And then you've got the white team, the German team with four showing the box. So you can see the box sort of set up there and then you can see a little bit of a pressure applied, but again, keeping that box shape. Now, one of the keys again to these sort of structures is that when, for example, the ball moves into a particular area, certain areas are being covered and backed up by players behind. So as we get into, for example, this ball, which goes down into this corner area, we'll notice that we've got a player on the ball and we've got a player out near the edge of the circle. But notice that the defender, number 13 here, that he moves in the gap between the two players to cover that space. So he covers the space between the two players. As the ball moves up, what's happened here is number 21, who's the highest player, rather than worrying about the gap between the two of them and sort of forcing the team to pass it back out, he's worried a bit too much about the ball going back. And then that's opened up the ability for this ball to then go across the court here. So generally we try to force them to pass back out and we cover those little central lines with the deeper player. Uh, let's go to another example. So here's another example of the four player box. This one's a more recent one. So we've got the five normal field players and the white team has had a player sent off. Now that was a really short clip, but what I wanted to show in this one is that when we go down to four players, one of the biggest problems we end up having is we're trying to cover a lot of space and the way we move the ball will determine how much the defenders have to move. So in this case, the German team's set up in dark with two players really wide apart. So one pass means the ball travels a considerable distance. So the white team has to then make sure that they move very quickly to try to cover all of these spaces. So watch how quickly they have to move when the ball goes from one side of the court to recover these angles. So they have to move. Now, if the ball goes back again and then back again, they're going to be moving in a great deal. Now, I'll, I'll bring this, this up here because I think it's worth mentioning. In this example here, there wasn't that need for the white team, the German team, to move really quickly left to right. And the reason for that is because the distance between the red defenders who are passing the ball isn't as great. So therefore the white team didn't have to move. So one of the problems that the box setup can have is that 
the greater the distance that the ball's going to get passed across the court, the more that players are going to have to move quickly to get across to it. All right, we'll have a look at another common four player structure that's used when we go a player down, and that's the diamond structure. So it's very similar to the square sort of structure, but this one's more covering the middle a lot more. And this one sort of more courage, encourages the opposition to sort of go much wider to attack rather than trying to use that space in the middle of the box. Here's our, our first example of it. So the white team here, the Austrian team has set up a diamond and you can notice how it looks like it covers a lot more of the passes into the middle a lot better. And the player in the middle of the court has a player closer to them. So it's more the corners and the outsides that appear to have the space. So this structure is more about forcing them out wide and forcing them into corners because it's more difficult for them to find somewhere to go through the middle. The other thing you'll notice too is you'll notice that we've got our two forwards, number 13 and nine. Nine on top of the circle, 13 on the left. And number 27, our deeper defender, sort of covers the gap between the two of them when the ball's on that left side. When the ball moves to the right side, they then cover the gap between the two players on their right. So they're always covering the gap between the two as it moves across back and forth. When the ball goes in the corner, the player who's basically on the point or the closest player moves to then apply that sort of pressure to them. Here's another example. Again, this is Austria in the white versus Netherlands in the orange, and they've set up a diamond here to try to defend. Again, right back on the top of the circle, less area to defend. You'll notice that it's a bit harder to try to get the ball into the middle because of that structure. And again, they end up having to try to attack by going wide. Now, it almost worked out for them. Now, one of the reasons why it almost worked out for them was as the ball goes down into this left-hand corner, what we notice is that ball has gone through into that middle player there. Now, there's just been a slight little error by the defending team here that as that ball got passed into that left-hand corner, that the player hasn't then covered that gap. So for example, on top of the circle here in the middle, that forward who is at the point, as soon as that ball goes into the corner, they need to step into the gap between the two players he's got in front of him. So if he steps into that gap, then what happens is that ball then doesn't come between them. So every player has got a second thing they need to do. And generally, if they end up looking at two players in front of them from their team, Generally, they should be covering the gap between those two players. Now we're going to look at one which isn't a very common four-player one that we see, and it's called the four-player slant. The idea of this structure is to encourage the opposition to play the ball down their right, down the defending team's right-hand side of the court. Now it's set up to try to make that happen with four players. So here's a, a quick video of it. All right, we're going to take a look at that one again and we'll, we'll go back to our little uh, whiteboard app so we can just have a look at some of the angles a bit better. So let's go a little bit closer. So the first thing is we've got our four players and we can sort of notice this slant happening here as we look at it. We're promoting a lot of space down this side of the court and we're trying to discourage anything sort of coming through into these sort of areas here. So as the ball is moved, 
it goes firstly across to the other side. And when it comes across here, this player is sort of coming over, trying to discourage them from going down here. And none of these players have sort of stepped up. So what they're really doing is leaving all of this room over here and trying to encourage the ball to come back into that area. As the ball moves across, and even as this player runs across, these defenders, again, just simply might shift a little bit, but again, they're trying to leave all of this space over this side of the court and make this side of the court look less inviting. So as they move, this player has stepped up a few, but then he's reminded, no, nope, we're not trying to do that. I need to move back. And then he moves back into his structure again so that we have this slanted line trying to force them to come down into this area. So again, he's sort of held a bit here. We're back to that line. And again, we're trying to encourage this pass down into here. Pass is made, wasn't a great pass. And this player has been able to get that, that stick onto it. And basically that's the right slant with four players that trying to get the ball down into that sort of right-hand corner area. All right, let's go back to our slideshow. All right, the next one we're gonna look at. Now this one seems a little bit silly. So we've talked about being a player down, but now I'm talking about that we're going to use a dice, an X shape, which is basically five players needed. So this sort of situation we're talking about isn't that we've lost a player, but the opposition's taken off their goalkeeper and now they've got an extra player because they've removed their goalkeeper. So it's now five players defending against six in this scenario. So here's an example of the X, but it's, it's now formed right back down towards the circle area. So there's a lot less area to defend. Now, one of the, the things about this again, remember is when we talked about this dice or this X structure earlier, it's about trying to force the opposition to go wide and really secure that middle area, but definitely not letting them come through that middle. And one of the things you'll notice here is that the dark team here is the German team, and it doesn't require a huge amount of movement from them to be able to protect this area, even though the white team has now put on that extra player. So we've fallen back near the circle there. We're protecting that middle ball coming through. We've also got some players a little bit higher if they need to go a bit wider and they can apply a little bit of pressure if they want, but there's not a lot of movement that's needing from the dark team, yet they're covering all those sort of angles. All right, so that's just a, a real quick example of how sometimes you can be a player down just because the opposition's got an extra player on the court and it's because they've pulled their goalkeeper off. So some of our defensive structures we use, we can actually use them back towards the top of our circle rather than, um, you know, up near the halfway. Now, someone just asked a question earlier about what was the position and role of that, that deep defender in the slant? The role of that deep defender is if the ball goes down the outside, down the left-hand side, for them to then be able to engage that player. Their role is also to ensure that the players in front of them, particularly the middle forward, is covering that hotline. And then their role is essentially to cover each of the gaps when the ball moves. So when the ball moves into the bottom right corner, they're sort of covering the gap between the player that goes and the player on the left. All right. Now, let's look at the situation where we're one player up. So we're talking about situations here where we're one player up because a player has been sent off the opposition. So the first one here is the Netherlands team, which is in orange, and we've got the white team, which is Austria. The picture on your screen at the moment that you see is very similar to how the Netherlands team has been setting up in terms of three on the right and two on the left there. However, in this situation, they're about to alter it because they've now gone a man up. So you'll notice that the left defender now pushes right up. 
And now they've got this structure sort of set up where it's making it very difficult for the opposition to go anywhere. So one of the things about being a man up is that it allows you to then look at being further up the court rather than having to be sitting back near your circle. So rather than sitting near your circle, it's about going and being a little bit more aggressive and taking the extra player advantage and go standing up the other end of the court. So let's have a look at that one again where we can draw a bit over it. So here, as we said before, we've got the Netherlands who sort of started in this sort of structure, which is their normal sort of structure, although it's normally a little bit deeper. They've recognized that they've got this extra player. So now what happens is this player is now going to move up and assist. But as they, they move up, it's not a man-to-man -man structure. It's basically covering lines. So we've got this player here, making sure nothing comes through the middle. We've got this player, so nothing comes down that shoulder. We've got this player here, so nothing comes down through here. We've then got this player over here trying to prevent anything coming through this area. But we then have a player back here in case it eliminates this front line so that he can then cover any of those options if something gets through. We've allowed both of these side passes because once this pass goes to the side, then we apply a bit of pressure. So here, they've then been able to move across and again, cover these sort of lines. This player is moving across slightly to cover anything through here. And the pressure, oops, the pressure then basically forces him to try to make some sort of pass through the middle there, rather than making a pass which holds possession. So we come back, pass comes through this area here. And they're away. All right, let's have a, a look at a, another one when their team is one sort of player. So here we've now got the white team. The Austrian team is one player up against the red team, against Poland. So hopefully you noticed at the start here, the structure that the Austrian team decided to use. So they decided when they were a man up, they're actually going to use a similar structure to what they were normally using again, such as Netherlands did. However, they've now created one free player because they're doing man to man. So these two are on each other, 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 but this man is now free. So this free player now tries to put themselves in a position where they can cover any sort of breakaway situations, any situations where a player is beaten, any sort of large gaps. So as we play, we notice that this player here starts to move around to cover certain areas. So as the ball moves, he's trying to cover passes through the middle. He's trying to cover passes down the side. If someone gets eliminated, he's going to step up on them. But here was a, an important bit. We talked about it being man to man, and we can still see those little basics happening here. So these two are a pair, the white player's mark and the red player. This white player is responsible for this player. And when the pass beats this player, he still comes back and creates that one-on-two situation. So you can see here how he's come back and he's still created that one-on-two situation rather than this free player having to push up and create it. So the free player is able to keep a position where he can offer cover, which we don't normally get. Now, notice he's now higher up the court, and that would be because these players have come deeper. If they've come deeper, that would provide too big a gap in the centre of the court, which then means if something was to break away, that they would have too much time to work together. So he's moved up the court. 
And he's put himself now in that position where this player sort of got eliminated and he can now encounter him. Whereas if this player here had been deeper and held deeper and we'd created this huge gap here, then that means he would not have been able to come up here and then help in that situation and cover that player as he got eliminated right now by the red player. So it's just important that each team knows how they're going to move when they basically go either a player up or they go a player down because it's, it's going to happen and it's very common. Now, another... Uh, really. So now we're going to talk about going a player... Um, we're going to talk about a situation where you're going up a player, but you're not going up a player because the other team's lost one. You've gone up a player because you've taken a goalkeeper off. So we'll show a couple of clips of that, um, showing how, again, it allows you to be a little bit more aggressive, albeit you now no longer have an actual goalkeeper to protect your net. So here, the white team, Poland has decided to take the keeper off. And they've decided to go to a situation where they have six field players and the German team has five. So again, you'll notice it's a little bit like a man to man. We've got these two concentrating, these two concentrating, these two concentrating, these two and these two. And this is our free player in the setup at the moment. So he's trying to cover little gaps through each time. So he moves around trying to cover those gaps. So as the ball's moved over here, notice that what's happened here is there's been a slight change. And now this guy is the free player and it's going through here. So do we all notice that that little change happened? Let's have a look at it again. So as this player was concentrating on him and he was the free player, as it developed and they basically came really close together, this player has now decided to pick him up and allowed this player to be free. And again, he was now looking at covering that gap. And now as the ball's beaten them and come down here, these two players now are looking at creating that one versus two. And because the forward who's been eliminated has got back in time, it's now actually turned it into a one versus three situation. All right, let's have a look at another one. Similar sort of situation again, same teams. And again, still being up um, that extra player because they're taking the goalkeeper off. So again, as we look at it, they're deciding to go man on man, man on man, man on man, man on man, man on man. And here is our free player again. Again, looking at sort of trying to cover that middle sort of option and not allow those sort of things to come through. He stepped up a little bit higher to put a bit more pressure on. Again, he can do that because this player is deep marking. So he doesn't have to be all the way back. He can hover in these sort of gaps. As this player gets the ball, he can then apply some pressure on him. And again, player, player. And again, that gap there is covered by that free man there. All right, watch one more clips with the, the six players. Again, the same game, white team with six. And you can again notice that as the ball moves out, we've still got our players who are connecting with each one and our free player. As the ball moves out, and this sort of forward is the one that's sort of been beaten by that pass, he's moving over, he's going to move up, and that gap through there again is covered by this player, that free man. And when the two players are eliminated through this gap, he's able to step up and apply that bit of pressure there. All right. 
let's go back to the slideshow. Right, so we're going to look at, we looked at earlier the four player slant. So we're going to look at some more situations which are a little bit uncommon. So the first one we're going to look at is something called, which I call the right slant. So we saw it earlier where there was a four player right slant, but this one is full five players. So again, it's the same principle, trying to force the opposition to play down the defender's right hand side trying to put the defenders on their four stick, trying to put the attacking team on their reverse stick and trying to put them into one area of the court all the time. So the way it sort of looks is like this. As we said, the aim is to force them to pass down the defenders right. The forwards are close together trying to prevent the ball going through the middle. And then the other players behind them are on that sort of slant, encouraging the ball to come down into that sort of right-hand corner. Now, they really want that ball to come to that player there where they can then apply pressure or it can go further down. So that player can receive and run or they can receive and pass into the corner, but that's sort of where the ball wants to go. So once they pass the ball down into that area around the halfway line, then players move in. So that middle player then moves across and applies pressure. The right forward moves across to apply pressure. The left forward covers the gap between the mid and the right forward. And the left defender moves in to cover the gap between the mid and the right defender. So the two back players are again are covering the gaps. Now, if the opposition pass the ball um, down the board side of the left forward, so down that left hand side where they don't want them to go then we really sort of are looking for that sort of left defender to try to step up and intercept that pass or try to then, if they can't intercept it, then to isolate that opposition player and force them to pass it back down the court so that it goes back and they can reset. So as the ball goes down, the players move, but notice the left forward didn't move to the ball because we want to create that gap for them to pass back out. Because again, the goal is for the ball to go down the right-hand side. All right, now one that's very similar to the right slant is one I call the right side funnel. So it's very similar, but the deep defender on the right doesn't tend to be in that angle. They sort of tuck in a bit. And sometimes the right side of it can be more of a straight line rather than an angle. And one of the teams that do something very similar to this a fair bit is the Netherlands team. And they sort of stack that right-hand side of their defence and their left-hand side has those two players and they're really sort of trying to get that ball to go down their right-hand side. So here's a little bit of, of an example. So you've got the Austrian team in white, Netherlands in orange, and they've sort of got those three players on their own right-hand side. So when the ball came down that left, they sort of stepped up and tried to apply the pressure. So it sort of roughly looks like this. They've got their two forwards and then they've got a sort of a midder, midfield player and two defenders at the back, sort of stacking that right-hand side with three players. So here's, here's another look at another one from a different angle. So you can see that sort of shape that's sort of stepped up and the ball goes out to that side. And they've forced them into that corner area where there's not a lot for them to get out of. So let's start to have a look at a little bit more of it in detail again. So we'll go back to our whiteboard. All right. So as we look at it, we can see, again, we've got this shape of these three players here and these two players. They're leaving this player alone, trying to encourage this pass to come. And then this player here will be responsible for applying pressure. So as the ball goes, they step over a little bit. This player stepped over a little bit. Now this gap sort of through here 
is actually covered by this defender here. And that's one of their roles is to cover that little line through. Ball goes back again. They're allowing this pass here. They're really trying to encourage that. Again, this player applies a bit of pressure, but notice how he's held off. He's allowing him to pass the ball down into the corner here. So as the ball then goes down or he runs, they're then put in a position here where they haven't got a lot of options and it's a very simple area for them to defend or for the goalkeeper to save a shot. All right, let's look at another example of them doing it. So here we go. So there's been a turnover. They've now restructured and reset. And again, we notice the same sort of structure. And we notice again, they're allowing this play to get the ball. Again, we notice this deeper defender here, sort of covering the gap between these two players here. Again, the ball goes into the corner and that deep defender applies the pressure. And then this player comes back and puts pressure on. And this middle defender comes in looking for the gap again between the two of them. And you can see in this situation, that gap, he's picked that ball up. And now they're on that breakaway. Watch that again. Let's look at a, another clip of them. Um, actually, no. We'll go back. All right. So here's one more example of it. And what I want you to look at here is when the defensive midfielder here, he does something a little bit different. So the middle defender in that line on the right, he decides to apply a bit of pressure on the person from Austria on the sideline so that he doesn't actually get the ball passed to him. And what ends up happening is that then makes it harder for the team to have things happening. What he then does is he then stops doing that and then that pass is allowed to be made down into that corner area. So watch the middle player in that set on the right side. He applies a bit of pressure to the Austrian player each time. So the pass is almost prevented from happening each time. So they're not really allowing the pass to go down that right side at the moment because he's really putting all that pressure on. This time he got the ball first and they're able to put the ball down, which is more where they want it to go. So if we have a bit more of a look at that again, we notice that as this middle player steps across and applies pressure here, the ball doesn't get passed down the defender's right side, which is where they really want it to go. And instead, there's a few more passes made. Then he sits back a little bit, allows him to get the pass. And you now have the situation where the forward has come back to help him. And it's at one verse two. The ball is allowed to go down the line, but not in court. Because if you notice the defender near the top of the circle, they're sort of covering the line if the ball was to come through. The ball goes into the corner. The nearest defender is then putting the pressure on. But notice that middle forwards now come back similar to like the man on man sort of stuff. And he's come back to create that one on two. And the defender deeper in the circle is covering the gap between them. Okay, now another one which isn't so common is we talked about the trapezium. This one's what I could just call an inverted trapezium. So it's two at the back and three at the front rather than having the three at the back. So here we're going to have the red team, Iran, has two at the back and three at the front in this sort of trapezium sort of shape. The two defenders are holding the gaps between the forwards in front of them each time. And when the ball moves to the side, 
the defender may shift out to the boards and the other defender holds the gap between the two forwards as in here. Just went off, we'll try that again. So as we go across, you'll see that the defenders are holding the gaps between their forwards. And then as we move over here in a second, notice that number two has moved wider. So number four, the defender is now covering the gap between the two forwards on the ball side. He's shifting back because number two is now coming back in. So they keep holding those gaps between the middle and the three front forwards keep applying that pressure. Now, the other thing to notice here too is that the defenders at the back are not being worried about where the opposition, the blue team, the Czech Republic, is running around the court. What they're doing is they're simply maintaining where their lines are. So they're not worrying about all these leads being made. All right, so we'll look at the same structure again. So again, we've got the three in front, the two at the back, sort of covering those sort of gaps and those lines the back two players are. Again, the blue team's running around a fair bit, but that's not altering the structure of the red team. All right, now, this one's slightly different. This is one we might occasionally see, but we don't see that often. And that's where the team, rather than having a three at the front and then two at the back, or having two at the back and three at the front, they're going to have a three at the front and three at the back. And the way they've done this is they've ended up deciding, well, we're going to use our goalkeeper as that sweeper, that middle defender role. So the keeper sort of steps up and then decides to mark one of the opposition players. Now, it obviously has some benefits and it has some, you know, weaknesses. Whereas if the goalkeeper gets too far out of position or moves too far away, they open the net up and they can often be caught in a one-on-one -on -one situation or even two versus them. So it's not a common thing, but here's an example of it. You see the keeper, number two, decides to be a bit of a defender and pick up the Netherlands player there and move with him. That frees up one of the other defenders, but... There's no real goalkeeper, so it has, has some weaknesses if a team was to get through. All right. I'm going to have a, a quick look at some thoughts on pressing um, as time's getting a little bit away from us. So the first thing is with my thoughts on pressing is that all players need to work together as a group, and they need to do it at 100%. That... We need to make sure that we don't give the opposition any time to get the ball under control or get their heads up. We need to make sure we take away passing options and direct the ball to where we want it to go. We need to cut the passing line to the opposite defender when the direct pressure is applied to the defender with the ball. So don't let them pass the ball back across the court again. We need to move when the ball is in transition, not on the stick. So the moment the pass leaves the passer's stick, we have to move before it reaches the other person's stick. If we're moving when the other person's already trapped the ball and that's when we decide to move, they have time to do things. So we've got to use the time of that ball in transition to move. The first press we'll look at is the man orientated press. So it basically starts similar to the man on man, but the two forwards are that little bit higher up the court. The defenders are close to their opponents, but two of them are a little bit closer to the boards. On the first pass, the forwards press hard towards the defender, closing that back pass, leaving the middle ball and the ball towards the boards open. The defenders then step up even further in front of their players and opponents, and they close the middle and the board down. So that back pass is cut off by those forwards and then the defenders are the ones who generally make the actual turnover. So it's generally not the two forwards, it's generally the defenders who pick up the pass. We'll have a, a quick look at a zone press. 
So it's similar to the man orientated press. The difference is two defenders are on the boards from the start, regardless of where their opponents are. And everyone presses on the first pass. So as I said, the two defenders here, you can see are, are on the boards, regardless of where their opponents are. Ball goes across, forwards move up again, came cutting that line and everyone's moving directly into those positions straight away. Right, here's a, a video example of a zone press. So the blue team is going to do the zone press. And again, their aim isn't to dispossess the player receiving that ball, that defender but their aim is to make that defender pass the ball down the boards so that that pass can then be intercepted. It also then means when they intercept the ball, they have def attackers in front of them to use to attack. So they don't want to be intercepting and have no one they can use. So the blue team sets up, and as soon as the pass is made, they're moving over, encouraging the pass down the boards, and then they step up, make that intercept, gives them players in front now to use, which now creates that sort of chaotic situation breakaway. And results in a goal. So I'll give you another quick look at the start of it again. So the pass comes across. They push forwards, opening up that board side. So the defender steps up and picks that up. And then they're away. All right. Here's a, another example of zonal press. So you've got the dark team here who's going to be doing it. This one, they, they don't use as much movement because it's not as required. They get the turnover a bit earlier here. So on this one, they tried to, once they pressed, the white player, the white left defender, tries to pass the ball in court rather than down the boards. Because again, you can see the dark team has sort of covered both boards. And then as the forwards apply the pressure and they're moving up to cut things off, he tries to pass it in. Quick little touch, which then opens up the opportunity. All right. An inverted press. So an inverted press is to me where we sort of have that sort of arrow sort of shape. So we've got the three forwards up the front there. And what the idea is, is when the ball's passed to an outside player, everyone then moves in a position and then they hold them and press them on the boards. So rather than pressing the middle player, they press the ball once it's passed out. So as soon as it leaves the stick and it's passed out, then what happens is players move across to then apply the pressure, remove the space, and then dispossess over on those sideboards there. Again, the forward tries to make sure that there's no pass back from where it came. So they can't then get out of that without making a pass and a turnover. Got another press called a middle forward press. And if we imagine that X shape, it's where that middle forward there is going to be the one that puts the initiation on. He's the one who starts it and applies that main pressure. So as soon as the ball leaves the passes stick, the middle forward runs at the receiving um, defender. Once the other players can see the middle forward, forward has placed the receiving player under pressure, for example, the head might be down, their body might be closed, they might be facing in court. Every other player moves in a position to cut down the options that player then has for that intercept. So ball goes across, the middle forward moves up to apply pressure, and then everyone else moves to cut those options out. All right, here's a video clip showing just an example of a press. So the white team Poland's going to press the green team, uh, which is Australia. So they've set up here and they're going to allow this pass over to number six, and then they press. And what they've done here is they've set up from the beginning to allow the defender on the right-hand side, number six here, to get the ball. And then as soon as six gets the ball, they basically prevent anything coming back through the middle. They prevent the pass going back to the defender who's passed it. And one of their players moves to then intercept or cut off the board pass. 
So the ball goes wide, can't pass now through the middle. The, defend, the forward in the middle of the court to the left of the screen is cutting off the pass back to the defender. And another defender from the white team stepped up to cover the board. So when the ball goes down, they intercept. So again, they've only really given the option to the Australian team there to go down the boards, but that's what they wanted and they've been able to then intercept that. Right, a common approach when pressing is to, to force that pass, like we've started to mention, to the left defender, to the defending team's right side, and then to cut off the pass back to the other defender across court. The next pass is often then made down the boards, and that's where the press then takes that turnover, that, that interception. So here we'll see that the pass goes out, as we look at it, to the left, goes back to the right, and now cutting everything off so it has to go down the boards. And then the intercept is made. So this is a very common method where the ball goes out to the left there, goes, is allowed to come back to the right, and then from that point, it's prevented from going back, and the boards is then where all the then turnovers are looking at happening. Now, I want to look at this one, but from a different point of view. It's, a, it's important to think about how the press is initiated. So what starts the press? Now, here's an example of a press, and it's initiated on the first pass. So not everyone looking at one player and waiting to see when they move. The moment that first pass is made, everyone then moves to then implement the actual press. So first pass, and then the player moves up to initiate that. It's all done based on the first pass. So as soon as that first pass is made, everybody then steps in front of their player. So first pass is made and everyone's now stepping forwards to get in front of their player. And we then have the intercept, which then ends up resulting in a stroke. Here's an example of a press from that Netherlands funnel structure. But the way it's initiated here is it's when the ball goes down the boards and then it's passed back out. So it's not initiated by the first pass, it's initiated by when the pass goes down the boards and then comes back out. So Netherlands in their, their structure, ball goes down the boards, ball comes back out, and now the press has started and that pressure has been applied. So if we look at it again, the moment the ball goes there, there's no pressure, the press hasn't started, but the moment this ball now comes back, you can see that forward there moving up to apply the pressure in that transition. And that's the moment. Now, once he's there and this player starts to take a step back and hold the ball, everyone else is now moving up. And now it's turned into a one-on-two situation and all the other players are stepping up. So here's, a, here's another example of a press again. This is Netherlands again in their setup. However, this one's initiated by one player who starts to apply the pressure and tries to force the ball to the other side of the court. And then once that pass is made, then you can notice that that, that press begins. So Netherlands holding their structure. And we can see how now that press has started. So we'll go back to that little bit there. So this player on the side, number 13, has the ball. When they pass, the closest forward now has decided he's now going to initiate the press. And notice the other players are sort of holding. And they're all holding while this player runs up. None of them move until that forward has now encouraged the second Austrian player at the top of the circle to pass out wide. And the moment that pass is now made, everyone's joining in. And they all come in to start that actual press. So the press is initiated by this first forward making that movement. And then everyone joins in the moment he can force that pass then to go out to that side of the court, which is then when they come in and apply that pressure for that turnover. Now, here's an example of one where it's, again, the first pass. It's initiated not by a player, but essentially by the first pass. So Netherlands, you can see they've got much, much higher in their 
sort of gone off. We'll go back to it. We can see Netherlands got much, much higher in their structure here. So you can automatically tell sometimes, let me just pause for a sec. If you're the team with the ball, a lot of times you can tell if a team's about to press just because you can see they've changed their structure and they've got a little bit more attacking in terms of how high they are at the court. So the Austrian team should be well aware here that, you know, Netherlands has changed. They've got a bit more aggressive. It's very likely they're going to press. First pass is made and then everyone moves. So as we can see, it's initiated by the first pass here. The moment the pass is made, players move. There it goes. Now everyone starts to move right now. No one's waiting to see what happens. Everyone's moving as quickly as they can in there to apply that pressure. All right, now, as we mentioned earlier, the thing with the press is it has risks. And the emphasis of a press is to move forwards and apply pressure to force a turnover. If the press does not work and the opposition beats the press, it often opens up scoring opportunities against. And pressing is a really a high-risk option. So it needs to be practiced and done really well. Here's um, just one example of what I'm talking about here in terms of if something goes wrong. So the white team, Poland, wants to press the green team, Australia. They try to press. And there's a goal against. Now, because Poland decided to press and put everything in, all their players had to move forwards. As they move forwards, the Australian player was able to get the ball here and get a free hit. And because they still played and went really quickly, what then happened was they still had two forwards up really high, but hardly anyone from the Polish team who could then get in a position to defend. So it was able to be a really quick breakaway, which was then able to result in the goal being scored. So it's one of those things about pressing that when we do do it, we have to realise that it does have risks to it in terms of opening ourselves up to goals against um, or corners against or strokes. Now, we talked a bit about initiating and how it can be on a pass and how sometimes certain people move. But here are a few of the timing things you can use. So the first thing is you could start a press setup where you don't have to move, where you're right up there putting all the pressure on and you're cutting off all the passes. It could be on the first pass that you start to press. It could be on the second pass. It could be pressing a particular player. So when this player is about to receive, we're going to press them. You could press a particular player or position. So, for example, you could press the player on the boards in the middle of the court. You could press when the ball is passed in a particular area of the court. So you could say when it gets in the bottom left corner, we're going to press it. When it gets to the edge of their circle on the right side, we're going to press it. And you can press when an error is made. So it might be a poor receive or a poor pass or a slow pass. Okay, if you're looking for any other sort of indoor resources, um, have a look at my YouTube channel. But we're going to basically end the, the sort of um, discussion there in terms of my, my side of it. So if you've got any questions or anything you'd like to, to raise or, or comments, um, please, please let me know. I know we've gone a little bit longer than we said, but I hope that I was able to provide you with a lot of different um, options there are for defending and give you a bit more detail on them as well rather than just a real quick sort of glance at them and not understand some of the finer points. All right, doesn't look like anyone's got anything they want to raise at the moment. If you want to ask me something later, feel free to email me um, or touch base um, any other way. All right, thank you very much for hanging around and for staying with us and enjoy the rest of your day or your evening depending on where you are. Thanks again.